that was just how how financial illiterate I, I was back then. Like really like a pai chi like that. Just prior to starting off with trading with my actual money, I did paper trading. I did 10 trades of paper trade, all wins. They said, hey, not bad, ah, all wins. So I went big into my first stock. I still remember that stock, some called Marie. People are all traders until that trade is not moving in the direction that they want. Then this particular trade ends up to be a long-term investment because they don't want to realize their loss. Man. So it becomes their long-term yeah. investment. Most of them are at their 52 week high. So this is in fact the worst time in, in my personal opinion, the worst time to get into any of the Magnificent Seven companies because people, the, the share price has went up so much, right? Just on the chat, right? Um, mm. Because so for like new investors, um, how would you recommend someone to find like good reads? Uh? Okay. Like Actually, keep in mind that they don't know how to read any financial statement. They just know how to read, look at charts and that's all. <laughs> Okay, welcome back to another episode of the Backholder Pod. So today, we have a guest episode. Um, his Jun Yuan. Uh, he recently just released a book and we'll talk more about it later. But maybe to just begin this introduction, right? Just a little bit backstory. I believe um, Eric and Jun Yuan, they known each other since uh, 2019, if I'm not wrong. So maybe I'll just get Eric to kickstart. Maybe just give a brief introduction of um, what you know of Jun Yuan and your experience thus far with him. Then maybe we'll get Jin Yuan to, to talk more about himself. Okay, so what do I know about Jin Yuan? Jin Yuan is like the most popular person in investing note back when, I think like 2020 or 2021. They had a competition. So they had this competition with a few popular people that are writing. Uh, so they have a big following. Then the poll came out, he was the champion. So, so <laughs> my impression of Jin Yuan right, is when I see his writing, right, when he first started writing investing notes, he's actually a very objective person. Like he will write it as facts. He won't really mix in a lot of his personal opinion. So you write down all. So this is what is good about, uh, for example, Tesla. This is all the pros. Then this is all the risks associated. And then you present a very balanced view. So I thought that was very refreshing because a lot of us, myself included, we tend to color our articles, our posts, right? With a lot of personal like impressions, a lot of personal feelings towards the stocks. Ah. Yeah. So for, for Jun Yuan, he presents a very nice, clean view of the stock, which I truly appreciate a lot in the sea of like everyone's trying to push their agenda, trying to push a narrative. Yeah, I think his was a breath of fresh air. La. Okay, thanks, Eric. Then, Jun Yuan, maybe we'll just give you some airtime on maybe just a quick introduction of yourself as well. How, how, do, you, how do you describe yourself to, to the new viewers? Okay, for those of you who are um, seeing me for the first time, my, my name is Jun Yuan, or you can call me JY for short. I'm a full-time retail investor and trader in the Singapore as well as the US markets. So I'm also a financial blogger at the singaporeaninvestor.sg where I write about things like company analysis, reviews of the company's quarterly results, as well as things like AGM summaries. Last September, I actually wrote a book titled Building Your Retirement Portfolio. So as the name suggests, this book comprises of the steps I've taken to build my very own REIT portfolio. So how this book actually came about was also from uh, suggestions from some of my readers who asked for a step-by-step -step guide on uh, how I actually started to build my own portfolio. And then in May this year, I finally managed to get somebody or some or the publisher actually approached me sometime in April to publish my book. And I'm deeply honored. And uh, this book can now be found in Books Kinokuniya in Singapore, as well as uh, some of the major bookstores in Malaysia, like Popular, MPH, Books Kinokuniya, and Sutaya Books. I think, uh, moving forward, I think this journey is going to be harder and prepare for the challenges. Lah, okay? yeah. Yeah, so I actually read your book end-to-end. Uh, -end, uh, I read the whole book. So Thank you so much. Uh, and, and then I, I saw that the, the most interesting part of, of that book is that right from the start, right? I think it's in first or second chapters, you, you straight away 
put up your entire portfolio. This is my portfolio. So I think at least for those who who are lazy, who can just you know get your book and then copy your portfolio right away, like, if if they really trust you on on <laughs> allocations. But <laughs> it's just for educational purposes. Only. <laughs> I, I think that's that's quite new usually because I, I read quite a number of investment books, but usually people won't put up their, their portfolio, you know, that explicitly that that openly. Yeah, it, it's not it's not common. I would say. Yeah. Yeah. It's not can, common. Yeah. yeah. Can, can we like just I mean take a step back right like mm. just want to understand the origin origin story like how you start investing because you said you didn't I, I watched one of your interview with James right uh, invest Kaki. yeah you, you said that you it's not like you started investing since like you know like 20 years old very young you actually started quite late right so yeah very and, late yeah can, can you like tell us the story like how, how do you get started like what what, what what are you doing in the initial years and and why the, the case uh, that you you start uh, so what actually triggered this move was this book called Secrets of Self-Made Millionaires by Adam Koo, where one of the chapters he talked about was uh, making money on the internet. And back then it was very famous, very popular in the US, but not so much in Singapore. So it really got me really excited. So when I left civil service, that was the first thing I went into. And uh, when I went into this, this so-called new thing, uh, and then people, I mean, including my parents, my girlfriend's parents, they were like, huh, what are you doing? What are you doing? You know, something that is not known here in Singapore. And then of course, starting off was a struggle. And then when I received my first check, because back then there wasn't anything like electronic transfers and everything. So all the earnings are by check. So I, it took me a while <laughs> for me to finally get, you know, be able to bank it. And back then uh, for me to, for the check to be, you know, the money in the check to be credited to my account. It takes about three weeks or so by Citibank. That was the thing. Right? So I was doing, when it comes to internet marketing, I was doing things like affiliate marketing when I promote digital products for, for a cut. Back then it was very popular because the cut was very high, about 70%. And because it was a very new industry, very few people I need. So of course, in terms of the profit is quite good. And then I was promoting products on Amazon. Back then, the affiliate commissions was very good. And also doing things like AdSense. Back then, I still remember things like those Forex advertisements. They can cost upwards of $1, $2, sometimes even $10 per advertisement. But fast forward to today, one advertisement, <laughs> one click, uh, you can only get what? Somewhat 10, 20 cents. If you're lucky, maybe 30 cents, 40 cents, depending on the location. Uh. So I was doing this for about 10 years or so before my father passed on in 2016. In fact, before my father passed on, he, he was actually a trader. So I still remember the days of this thing called Teletext. Where he was uh, monitoring the price movements, like the ticking price movements on that TV screen. And back then, I know nothing about stocks, shares. I only know that the numbers are ticking up and down. Uh. So he also asked me, uh, because he is quite IT illiterate, so he asked me to actually help him with a technical analysis back then. Uh, and then I said, I'm not interested because, uh, you know, back then I, I've not pictured myself doing all these things. So it's only after my father's passing and then I was the executor of his will. And one of the things that he had in, his, in his, his assets was a portfolio of stocks. And back then when I visited the lawyer's office, I asked him one question. He asked me back 10 questions <laughs> Like, couldn't. Could I answer them? So it led me to think like, it cannot, you know, this cannot, it cannot be this way. Like, I need to learn how to deal with all these things. So that's when I started to read about investing and trading. And of course, being somebody who is financial illiterate, I know nothing about what income statement, balance sheet, cash flow statement, nothing. So it was a huge struggle for me. And when I tried to go to the bookstores in Singapore to look for books related to investing, most of them are dedicated to the US stocks, which mean the accounting standard is different because they are using GAP. So, so it's really, really hard for me to understand. And there are very few resources out there dedicated to the Singapore market. So the one that I found was uh, Singapore. So now it's being branded as the smart investor. So how I learned was that I read the entire website back then from the very first article they published to the very last article to at least know the basics of uh, investing. And, and as for trading, I read this book by Adam Koo called The 
Secrets of Millionaire Investors. Lah. So there were some chapters dedicated to it. And the book also helped me learn some of the basics related to investing. So, so I got started then. Lah. And of course, I also seek my wife's help lah, because she's an accountant. She's way better than me in terms of reading financial statements. So every night is like, you know, I have a list of questions to ask her. About. The guru. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like a Mr. FAQ here. <laughs> yeah. So, so up until 2016, really your, your focus is on your affiliate marketing, your business, and, and you have not built any portfolio at all. Meaning no, that by, by that time, money is all in bank account, is it? Is that uh, the case? Yeah, correct. Money is all in bank account because I know nothing about investing much because my father is predominantly a trader. So, you know, as far as trading goes, right, it's not about uh. So there are times where you lose. Then I know nothing about investing. And then uh, I don't know there's such thing that exists, you know, you buy companies and then you collect dividends and all that. That was just how, how financial illiterate I, I was back then. Like really like a pai like that. Yeah. So when I first started off, I started off trading in the Singapore market. Lah. And that then, was uh, before 2016 or after? Just after 2016. Oh, that, that was after you re received the inheritance from your dad, right? The portfolio is already, you already have the portfolio. Yeah, then, not my portfolio actually. Okay. It went to my mom. Lah. So I okay. was helping her manage because she's, she also don't understand English. Mm. So I had to, you know, do something about it. So uh, I started off with trading because I, I felt that that was the fastest way to try to deal with it. Lah. So of course, prior to starting off with trading with my actual money, I did paper trading. I did 10 trades of paper trade, all wins. They said, hey, not bad, lah, all wins. So I went big into my first stock. I still remember that stock, some called Marine. Then, wow, first stock. Did you go all the way? No, I went stop loss hit Obakai, okay. four figure loss. But thankfully, I managed to cover back later on in the month. I was hang. I was <laughs> so that was my first, my initial journey. Then, uh, so you know, as as far as trading is concerned, it really depends on Mister Market. It, it, after you put in a trade, it's something that you cannot control already. It's just like after you finish your exam. Uh, I mean, you you finish your answers, everything. You submit the exam script. Uh, you can't change anything already other than just praying hard that you get a good result. So as far as trading goes, I praying hard that you, Mr. Market will give you a win instead of a, a loss. So I, because of the, the income being quite inconsistent, because sometimes you have very good money, sometimes it's very thorough, and sometimes it's just meh meh. La, so, so, yeah. Actually, I want yeah. to ask, right? Because some people, they start out, they don't know how to start, right? So they, for example, they start trading. They thought that trading is investing. And then slowly, slowly, they, they will morph into like a strategy that they are comfortable. It, it could mm. be like, you know, continue to do the trading or it could be like just become an investor or just become a passive uh, investor, right? But in your case, right, it seems that you started out trading. Then you learn about the fundamentals. You read all these financial statements and so all on. Right. Then you, you in, in one way, like there's one pocket that is like really for long-term investing. But at the same time, you still keep your trading, right? How, how do you like, you know, compartmentalize these two different activities and how, how do you segregate the money? Do you have a systematic way to, to you know, keep track of, of these two different things? To me, it's very different uh, between trading and <laughs> Yeah, and it's very, very uh. different. So I made the same mistake like many of those traders come investors made in that. Uh, people are all traders until that trade is not moving in the direction that they want. Then this particular trade ends up to be a long-term investment because they don't want to realize their loss. Man. So it becomes their long-term yeah. investment. Become it also happened holder. for me as well. Yeah, correct, correct. <laughs> it becomes a back holder. It Praying that it will somehow bounce back. Yeah, so I was like that as well, right from the start lah, when I was uh, trying to, you know. And then I felt that this is very important to differentiate between trading and investing. Maybe I share a little bit more because for investing, you need, really need to understand the company in terms of its financial performance, debt profile, dividend payout, and also what the company is going to do in the years ahead. So you focus more on the financial figures, the, uh, the management's plans for the company. But in terms of trading, you just look at the chart. So, you know, in terms of how the candlesticks move and then making use of things like the technical indicators to, to determine whether or not you should buy, buy into a, a particular stock to trade. And then for trading, it's very important that one have a stop loss 
So which means that when you hit the stop loss target, uh, you must really get out of the trade and realize the loss so that you protect your capital to go again. Sorry, Jin Yang, what, how big is your trading portfolio size? Uh? It depends on the market also. I mean, it really depends on, on the market condition. Like for example, right now, I'm, I'll be very careful to enter a trade because the US market, as well as the Singapore market, they are also hovering near their highs. So I foresee a pullback to happen. So even if I find a good trading setup, so personally, my, uh, I will be very careful in terms of allocating a certain amount to enter a trade. Yeah. Right. Is it like six digits, five digits? Oh, don't for the, for the entire... I don't have. It depends also. It really depends. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Uh, I just want to follow up on the, your, like, mm. the, your what's that? investing portfolio, right? So right, right now, most of it is consisted of REITs and dividend stocks, right? Correct. REITs and banks. Correct. Because the list that I got is, was from May 2023. So it has like the usual, like OCBC, UOB, DBS, then some of the top risks in Singapore. Has that list changed since 2023? Not much actually. So from 2023, I think I only added one more REIT and that REIT is a Capital Land India Trust. So the reason why I built such a portfolio is because, as I mentioned just now, because of the irregularity, I mean uh, irregular trading income, I need something to supplement. So this portfolio comprises of REITs. Why REITs? In the first place was because uh, most of the REITs uh, in the portfolio back then, they were giving out dividends on a quarterly basis. So that was one of my requirements to add a particular REIT to my portfolio. Why quarterly basis? So that it can give me a stable stream of income on a more regular basis. But unfortunately, when uh, most of the companies change full financial reporting to half yearly basis. The dividend payout frequency also changed la, to half yearly. So quite a few, I mean, quite few REITs right now continue with their quarterly dividend payout. But I mean, I'm still keeping invested in them because I believe in the business fundamentals of all the REITs. La. Of course, there are one or two, they are not performing well quite now. But, but okay, there are two actually to share, la, just to share with you. One is a Suntec REIT and one is Easy World REIT. For Suntec REIT, uh, I actually follow up with the management regarding its uh, debt profile. And one of those things, why I'm keeping invested in it is that the management is very upfront about the challenges and they actually have like a plan in place on what they are going to do to bring down their theory ratio to about 40%. Uh, that was the target. And they are going to divest some of those strata units of uh, Suntec offices to bring down this uh, gearing ratio. They are also looking to bring, to divest off the Australian offices, right? I mean, but then the thing is that because of the high interest rate environment and also the low interest in the taking up of the office properties in Australia because of the working from home culture. So I think it's going to take some time. But for Easy World Read, I think it's also partly because of weakness in the logistics sector in China. I mean, despite my best efforts to follow up with the CEO personally on the headwinds and what they are going to do. But I mean, despite of all the efforts I've taken, like, unfortunately, things didn't quite work out. So I think that's part and parcel of the game. Like. So, but fortunately, this easy worry is just about 5% of my, uh, my entire portfolio size. So, I mean, a loss is a loss, like, but at least it's not so hard pain. From what I see, yeah. the average price Based in 2023, like, I don't know right now, a lot of your reads are underwater. Correct. All underwater, in fact. It's <laughs> very rare. Really, like, except for the banks, yeah. Yeah. Where, does that concern mm, you? Like, I, like let, let's say for Easy World Read, Sun Terry, personally, I wouldn't touch it. I wouldn't even consider me messaging their CEO. <laughs> because even if there's any change, like you mentioned, it will take quite a while. Right. So it's like me messaging the first read. CEO. The first three CEO can tell you all kinds of stuff. Then like are they going to really do it? Those kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I understand. I mean, we can only do our best right. uh, as far as uh, trying to research, trying to engage with the CEO is concerned. Uh. But as far as your question goes on whether or not I'm concerned, of course I am concerned <laughs> because my, my hard earned money is at stake. <laughs> but the thing is that right now, if, if, if we were to look at the REITs in general, they are all weak. So if you are a REIT investor, most of 
I mean, most of you will probably be seeing red in your portfolio. Right? And this is caused by reasons that cannot be controlled, right? the high interest rate environment. And at this point in time, the interest rate is still at high of 5.5 to 5.75%. But then I was reading the news this morning about the Davish comments from Jerome Powell that he said that interest rates will, the first cut will come this year. So I think right now, what time is it? Close to nine. I think the reads will go up today from his, from his comment. But of course, that's it. I think it's just going to be momentarily. Uh, I mean, uh, it's not going to last like, until you see when the Fed is going to make his first cut. Right now, how big is your like pot? trading investment portfolio size uh, for you for it to be sustainable uh, to sorry i can't your... review the, the size if okay. that's okay yeah yeah but but it's but, okay la. i mean i'm a, still building right I'm on the tension right now yeah on the tension if i can ask your trading and investing i'll presume your investing is a larger like in terms of percentage it's a lot definitely bigger than your trading right definitely it's a lot bigger because it's more it's it's a safe bet like i would mm. say it's a is because i'm buying into companies that uh, that has got a very good business fundamentals. Unlike trading, it's like, you know, you go based on uh, charts and charts alone is not enough. You have to see things like the macroeconomic environment and things like that. So I think it's, it's quite uncertain. So I'm, I'm quite a risk adverse person actually. So and there are, there are investors that look at this read, uh, not just like specific, right? I mean, this generally reads market and say that, oh, DPUs uh, get slower, interest rate remain high. And then right. They are very bearish on this entire market. You look at the chart also, I, I'm feeling bearish <laughs> <laughs> just looking at the chart. Yeah, it's definitely bearish. It's, yeah. it's very bearish right now, in fact. So, yeah, then there are people who say, why waste time on, on all this, right? You look at the US market, even, you know, companies like Tesla also doing well, <laughs> the entire Magnificent Seven is doing well. Why, why waste time on, on REITs, right? So what, what's your comment on, on this group of investors that, that think that REITs is like gone case? Okay, it really depends on what they want out of uh, their investment uh, portfolio. La. I mean, for those who want dividends, I mean, income, income investors, la, they will go for the Singapore market. I would recommend the Singapore market for them because most of our, our the REITs, la, particular, right now, at those prices, uh, they have a yield of a 5% and above. Yeah. But then in terms of capital appreciation, I think it's very, very low. Unlike the US uh, market where the cap capital appreciation opportunity is much higher, especially if you buy into, like you said, the growth companies, especially the AI related companies, then also depending on the price that you buy, then uh, you may see a very, very good capital appreciation. But that's it, at this point in time, I probably will not want to touch. I'll be very careful when either entering new trades, you know, buying more stocks on the US market because uh, as you can see, the US market is quite topish right now la, in terms of its uh, chart movements. So I'll be very careful on that as well. But Sorry, Kevin, I, I, I just wanted to follow up on this. this. Yeah. Dividend stock versus like S&P or whatever US stocks that you're talking mm. about, right? Because I, I do understand the criteria or the needing of income to supplement to supplement your daily lifestyle, right? And cost right. of living. But I was wondering, there was another conversation that I had with a friend that was talking mm -hmm. about why not just buy S&P, like a broad-based index or a portfolio of US stocks. Mm -hmm. And then if you need the income, you just sell off a bit by bit. Like particularly for that year, financial year, you need, let's say, 40000 for expenses. And then you slowly mm -hmm. sell out 4 k per month to support mm -hmm. your income. And then not have to go through this entire... As we know, the REIT environment is under tremendous amount of pressure right now. So yeah. that's why it's very... It, it, it's quite scary for, for, I believe, for most... By the way, disclaimer, I also have REITs in my portfolio, <laughs> although very small. But yeah, I, I was just wondering, have you ever considered that version? Which is, since everybody say that US is the best, right? US stock market mm -hmm. just keep going 90, 45 degrees to the right. Have you considered just going to US and then extract income on your own on a discretionary basis? Would that be something you consider? Yeah, it's definitely something that I'm considering right now. In fact, I'm looking to rebuild my US portfolio. So I'm doing a lot of work on the back end to, to understand more about the companies in deeper details. Lah. So uh, I'll be sharing a bit more details in the coming months on that. So it's definitely something that I'm looking at to first build my US portfolio first. And depending on the amount of success that I have in that one, because 
I think every market has their own fair share, fair share of challenges. So whatever things that I learned in the US market, in the Singapore market, as weed investor, I may face, I mean, I may not be able to as, apply exactly the same thing in the US market. And there are also things for me to learn. Uh, and being, I mean, as the word investment goes, la, there is no such thing as sure win. So I'm also proceeding cautiously as I go along. La. And also at the same time, learning from experienced people like you guys in the, you know, who has a lot of experience Bun in the US Bunti market. Is the, yeah, Bunti is the most experienced <laughs> in the US market here. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah, he's for your experience. He's DCSS. <laughs> what? How many years? No, I started since uh, 17, 2017. Not, not oh. very long. No, uh, but it's still, still many years ahead of me. So in, in US market, right? Let's say if you really enter, right? What, what kind of sectors that you will cover, like, do, do, will you, will you really like focus on companies that is more stable in terms of their fundamentals, or, or do are you are open to all kinds of of companies? Because you are looking at risk, right? I, I believe risk is quite stable. Correct. Yeah, is, is that one of Correct. your key criteria? Okay, in terms of a US market, I think it's, it's a little bit different for me because for the US market, the focus is more on capital appreciation. Lah. So my focus is uh, more on different sectors. Lah. I mean, I want to build a balanced portfolio comprising of uh, companies from the 11 S&P sectors as much as I can. Because for the US market, it really depends on, like, I mean, you can have some sectors that is going very well right now. And there are some sectors that is not so, so not doing so well. Lah. So for me, okay, one of those mistakes that I made back then that, that led me to this, this uh, proposed move was that uh, back then I was also buying based on trends. Like for example, in 2020, during the COVID breakout, and then every, everyone was staying at home. So companies like C Limited was doing very well because everyone was shopping online. So back then, I think the price was about $300 back. Yeah, that, the good old days. So when it fell to about, I think it was below $200, I thought, hey, it was an opportunity. I mean, to ride on to the trend. So I bought some shares of C. And then I think you know the narrative <laughs> moving forward right now. Yeah, Another one was, yeah, loss. I mean, yeah. But for C, I'm still holding on to it because I do see some potential on two things. Number one is Shopee because they are the market leader in Southeast Asia. And I foresee some growth in this. Lah. And also another one is in C Money, where they have a digital bank and all that. So it do take some time for, for this to, to so-called materialize, bear fruits. But of course, they do have some headwinds in Garena, which is the digital gaming, which I think is dying business. Because as far as uh, gaming goes, once you lose your audience, that's it. It's very difficult to get them to go back to that game again. And also as far as a gaming development is concerned, it's a very fast moving industry. So if you are not fast enough to catch up, like you see companies like Tencent, they are so fast in terms of the development of games. So you will just lose out very quickly. So that's C. Another one I bought in back then was PayPal at about 120 back then because PayPal's price was also it was also doing well during the, the COVID period, I mean, where everybody was shopping online using this uh, online payments platform. And then the price, as you know, right now, it's also fell by quite a fair bit. Like. So that was like kind of like chasing the trends back then. So this made me realize that I cannot just go for one sector. So I need to like really diversify because the US market is just so big. 6,000 over stocks, if I'm not mistaken, compared to Singapore, like what, 600, five, 600. I mean, if you take away the illiquid ones, you take away the, those with a very bad fundamentals, not much really. So for the US market, I think I've got to use a very different strategy. And the focus is on capital appreciation because all the dividends are being, you know, there's a 30% withholding tax. So the strategy is different. Whether or not it will work out for me, I don't know. Maybe in another year or two's time. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds, I sounds like... More. It sounds like you're going in and just whack Magnificent 7, right? Uh, Focus on the growth. Now also cannot whack. <laughs> now also cannot whack, eh? because most of them are at their 52-week high. So this is, in fact, the worst time, in, in my personal opinion, the worst time to get into any of the Magnificent 7 companies because the share price has went up so much, right? So in terms of its financial results, people will expect the same in terms of the growth of its uh, financial figures. So anytime these figures or even the forecast the outlook right is 
lesser than what analysts or the retail investors expect, you are going to see a very, very huge pullback. And the pullback will probably be an opportunity, in my opinion, to, to buy. Sorry, but when, when do you expect this pullback to happen? Is it by this year, by next year, by two years later? Oh, this year is definitely not going to happen because like, as you see, like AI companies, right? They will continue to do well. Like. Maybe, I mean, next year, I'm not sure. It will depend on who is the president because then you, you know, you will have a different kind of uh, narrative playing out. Like. I mean, then if Trump is the president. Yeah. Wait, but then if you're waiting for this pullback, based mm. on what we have seen this year, right? S&P could continue going up another like 10, 20%. Not saying it will happen, like, but if that happens, even if they pull back, it might just come mm. back to this current level. Like in that case, wouldn't it be better to start investing now rather than trying to time the mm. whole thing? Okay, because right now I just feel that the whole the whole market is just too expensive right now. I mean, I'm not. I don't know what will happen in one or two years time. But based on my personal experience, the little experience that I have with the US market, I felt that it's, personally, I feel that it's better to wait. For, for a pullback because it, it, it's bound to happen like, I mean for every like because the share price move in wave like, so it wave up and wave down like a high tide low tide that kind of thing so I'll probably be waiting I mean right now the market is definitely bullish and it's very likely to be bullish in the second half of the year leading up to the presidential elections in the US in November like. and then it depends on who is the president I think from the looks of it likely to be Trump then you are going to get those days where, you know, the market move up and then come down very sharply, then go up again. So I think when the market comes down sharply, I think that could be the time to, to buy. I think we are probably going to see the, the same kind of pattern like, when Trump was the president back then, when he was, when he was the president back then. Like, yeah. Yeah, Eric got some questions? Oh yeah. So, Jian, let's talk <laughs> about some of your biggest wins in the stock market since you started investing okay do you have any like multi baggers like nvidia i don't have okay i don't have much about us market because it's you know i, I i'm going to restart the whole thing so singapore. yeah singapore market dbs my average price of dbs is about 21 plus so right now inclusive of dividends and uh, based on its share price yesterday i think the whole capital appreciation is about 100%. 90, 97, 98, somewhere there. Yeah, so that was, that is one. And the second one is the Fraser Center Point Trust, where I was uh, lucky enough to get in at 185 when it was back in 2020 when it was uh, at a COVID low. Lah. So this is also another one for me that is doing very well. And if you look at it, for Fraser Center Point Trust, it's, one of the reasons it's doing well is because it's very Singapore-centric where all of the properties are located in Singapore. So you see, even though many of the REITs saw their unit price tumble big time, but, but Fraser Center Point Trust is holding on very well. So I guess that's one of the contributed to my gains. I think investing in REITs is different. Right? You look at the chart, it's like, oh, it didn't go up as much. But actually, if you include in all the dividends, uh, if you assume yeah. every time you receive dividend, you just reinvest back, right? But I mean, investing, you have to look at it for the long term. Yeah. So I always advise people who do not have the money now uh, to not buy. I mean, do not, I mean, if they need to use the money within the next one or two years to not touch REITs because I don't foresee it to recover in the next year or so uh, because interest rates are still high. The number of acquisitions is still very low. Yeah, can, can I just follow mm. on this, right? Let's say mm. if interest rate is not like continue to go up, it just, you know, slowly stagnant or down a little bit, right? Mm. Do you foresee that all these still continue to add on the financing costs for the REITs that you monitor? Because, mm. you, you know, the their financing is not like just one off, right? They, they will still continue to, you know, like refinance by issuing new bonds. So this one will continue. So even Correct. if interest rate just remains stagnant or even down a little bit, their financing costs will still creeping up, right? All right. Is, is that the case or how, how big is an impact to, to the DPU? Okay, for maybe I talk about what will happen this year. Like my thoughts about how REITs will, the, the REITs performance in terms of their financial performance and DPU this year. In my opinion, financial performance will just be in a low single digit percentage because of a lack of acquisitions. So it will 
Growth is purely based on the rental escalations built into the contract. And together with things like higher financing costs, DPU this year will likely be down by a single digit percentage. And even so, like you are right, I mean, even if the US Federal Reserve were to cut, start cutting interest rates this year, it will not be immediately factored into the, the REITs, especially those with a high percentage of a borrowings hedged to fixed rates. Because it, you will need to let the loans you know, mature, then they refinance at a better rate. So when that happens, uh, those REITs with a lower percentage that is hedged to fixed rates will probably be one of the first to benefit from interest rate cuts. So in terms of acquisitions, I think very likely they will only start to come in next year, depending on how many times the US Federal Reserve will start, I mean, will cut interest rates. Lah. But as far as a longer term outlook is concerned, I think uh, it's very difficult to go back to the days of 0 to 0.5% kind of interest rate environment. I'm looking at a new normal of about 3%. If you look at the dot plot chart, it also states, it also suggests as such. So for the REITs management, they will have to learn how to work towards this new normal of about 3%, 2.75-3%. And of course, not every REIT will recover we recover to their previous glory. Lah. Only those with a very solid sponsor. With, but uh, if, if the yeah. expectations of, of, of the interest rate environment moving forward mm. to be elevated, right, might also mean that the heydays of, of REITs or companies that are very interest rate sensitive might be over as well, right? Because at least over the last decade or decade and a half, a lot of the REITs were doing very well because of the extremely low REITs environment. Would, would that be a concern for you moving forward? Mm. I have to look at, I mean, not all will recover the same. I mean, in my, in my personal opinion, not all will recover the same. Whether or not they will recover to their previous glory, I think the ones they are like by, by Capital Land or by Maple Tree, I think shouldn't be a problem because of their very solid sponsor in Capital Land investment and uh, Maple Tree investments, uh, respectively. So as to whether or not they can hit their previous highs, uh, I think it's still early days to say that. Uh, and in terms of recovery, I think it's, I'm actually looking at 2025, 26, or even 27. It depends on the speed at which the US Federal Reserve starts cutting interest rates. I think this is very important because at, at, at this, at this at an environment like this, I think it's very difficult for any management to make aggressive acquisitions like what we have seen in the years before. But I think it, for normalization, I think it's going to take some time now. So that's my personal take on this. Yeah. Anyone else? K Eric, Kevin? Oh, just on the chat, right? Because so for like new investors, how would you recommend someone to find like good reads? Okay. Like actually, keep, keep in mind that they don't know how to read any financial statement. They just know how to read, look at charts and that's all. <laughs> yeah. I that's think just... it's very I think it's very important to to actually get a very good understanding of a particular read la, before investing in it. So in my personal opinion, the REIT must be something that they really know what the properties are. Take for example, like CICT. All they need to do is to visit the, the malls, the Capital Land malls, and they see the, the, the kind of the crowd and everything. That's number one. Number two, of course, in terms of financial statements, of course, I can understand from a newbie's point of view, it's like for me back then, it was very, it's very difficult to understand. So in the first few pages of the annual report, they do have a financial highlights of uh, gross revenue and I think uh, things like net property income and DPU. So all they need to do is to just see the arrow. As long as it's showing an upward moving trend, then that, will definite, that is definitely one of the things that they can do in the initial stages to screen out between a good read and not so good one. I mean, without any knowledge of how to read financial statements. So in the first few pages of the annual report, there is this, there are some graphs of the, the performance of these uh, some of these uh, key financial figures. So that that is how I will how I will advise la. But of course, it it will be good for new investors to actually learn about the basics of how to read and understand the financial statements and also things like occupancy rate and all that. How to make sense out of it la. Because to not even need to learn la. I mean, it's not an easy process. But I mean, nothing is easy in this life la. So. I just want to ask you, right? Yeah. How how important 
is the sponsor for REITs? It's definitely very <laughs> important. I mean, it does have some importance to some extent. <laughs> because, it, I mean, if you look at sponsors like Capital Land, they do have a lot of properties under their, their, that they are invested in. So having said that, uh, these REITs uh, have the right of first refusal to some of these properties. Unlike, and also another thing is that because of the, the reputation of these big sponsors, when it comes to refinancing and all that, definitely it will be easier compared to the smaller REITs that do not have a solid sponsor. That is from experience. Uh, that is from what I understand from some of these REITs, uh, the big ones as well as the small ones. So the small ones, the management do highlight that they do face with some headwinds with regard to number one, financing, number two, getting a more favorable rate. I mean, that's quite understandable because I mean, if you are a bank, you also don't want to approve loans to companies that A, the financial, I mean, the, the financial performance is not so good, quite normal. I just have uh, this question, right? Because yeah. there are some reads like those managed by Capital, right? Yeah. I mean, they are also a very big sponsor, right? They are a big company. Mm -hmm. But somehow they are read a bit too, <laughs> if I can. Yeah, I agree with you. <laughs> That's why I only have one. Yeah. <laughs> well, how, how does that translate to your you you saying that oh they're a big sponsor, they have good uh, they good rates, better rates from the banks, they also have first right of refusal. Yeah. But you okay, see also, even a big hmm. sponsor like Capital, they can also screw it up <laughs> okay but... for sponsor right also we have to look at their financial performances also i mean for capper okay from my understanding because capper is not in my investment watch list but from what i can recall the financial performance is quite irregular over the years correct me if i'm wrong unlike capital land investment which has a more stable financial performance la. Actually, if i'm not if i'm not mistaken because i i did not study about capital capper limited I think the they are quite similar in a sense because developers their cash flow I don't think are very consistent, not like REITs. So if you remember there was this period Capital Land also languished at like that, low two dollars for quite a long time. Yeah, yeah, but but then the I think also the investments by uh, the government linked companies also have a part to play, I guess. Yeah, but of course, having said that, like, I think it's also important to just focus on like for, for the for the companies that we want to invest in. I think it would be good to just to focus on the company's performance. Lah. I mean, that's that's my personal take on this. Lah. I mean, no matter how good a sponsor is, like take for example, um, SPH Read, for instance. Lah. I mean, I'm not saying that the sponsor is good, but then even if they're the, the right of first refusal to properties, like the other one was Lita More. And I think if I'm not mistaken, they they try to price it at a very high premium to the REIT. So I think also we have to note developments from this these companies la, and how the management works. So I can't comment too much on Kepler because I, I did not study about its business fundamentals and also it will not be fair for me to pass any judgments about them. Actually, Chinyu, if your friend today mm. approach you, right, and ask mm. you what's your top three best REIT, like maybe they're, they're, they're just starting, right? For example, me. So let's say I ask you, what's the top three best read stock in your watch list or in your portfolio currently? Can you, will you mind sharing? What are the top, top three, three that reads that I would recommend can people buy to one. buy? Yeah, can can buy. buy one. Okay, first maybe, will be... Maybe add. not recommendation, la, but yeah. What, yeah, what, yeah. <laughs> what, what do you think are good reads? Like top three. Okay. Actually, top three, if I were to give my recommendation, number one will be Capital Land Ascenders because it has a good mix of uh, Singapore as well as overseas properties. So for those of you who, I mean, for, for people who are worried about the concentration that they have overseas, 60% of properties are in Singapore, while the other 40% are in countries like US, Australia, UK, and Europe. And they do have a good mix of industrial as well as data center properties. Another one I would recommend is Capital Land Integrated Commercial Trust, or CICT for short. They are like the, the biggest right now in Singapore, where they have a very good mix of uh, retail and office properties. And 90% of its revenue is derived in Singapore. So for those who, you know, they are very concerned about the valuations of overseas properties la, and the, the Forex 
unfavorable forex conversions. So this is another one that you can consider. And the third one that I would recommend is a Fraser Center Point Trust, where 100% of the properties are in Singapore. That's number one. Number two, they are located in the various suburban locations in Singapore. And also because they are located in the various suburban locations in Singapore, they, they can maintain a consistent amount of traffic to the malls in that they appeal to that, that particular suburban location and they are located near transportation nodes. Say, for example, you come back from work, you will go to this, you just pop by these malls to get your basic necessities or makan before heading back home. Likewise, when going to work, you will just pop by these malls to get your breakfast then before going to work. And also one of the things about these malls is that most of them are in uh, essential businesses like supermarkets, food courts, pharmacies, and also enrichment classes like piano, tuition, so on and so forth. So I think the, the, in terms of performance over the years, it has been very consistent as well. So these are the three that I would recommend. Would you take note of? Would you? Yeah, I, I try to <laughs> let me push back a little. Okay, not not yeah. not attacking your portfolio or anything. I'm I'm just for myself okay, okay. because when I see these three holdings, right, for Capital mm. Ascenda, Capital Integrated, very long. Right? The issue with the first two Capital Land is that their size is super big, so there's not much growth going on. So would you say that it's not suitable for people who, for like young investors? who are looking more for capital growth. Oh, capital growth, I will not, not recommend so REITs. I will not recommend REITs because REITs is for income, is for dividends. So for those who are looking for growth, I will ask them to go straight into the US market where the opportunity is much, much better. I mean, the opportunities for capital appreciation. So for people who, I mean, they, they first need to uh, know what they want out of their investment efforts, whether is it income or whether is it for capital gains. La. But then in your case, right, since you are using mm. this as your, to supplement your living costs, does the growth outpace the inflation or like, it does it just like inflation? So you have to keep pumping money in basically. Okay, I'm, <laughs> I'm still growing my uh, read actually right now. I mean, I'm still growing this portfolio. So it's an ongoing process that I'm, uh, I'm doing. La. As far as the overall yield from this portfolio is concerned, if I'm not mistaken, it's about five plus percent based on its latest Y2023 uh, dividends. I, if I'm not mistaken, it's about five plus percent, which outstrips the inflation rate. But of course, I, I feel that I can do better. And I'm still working on to build just to share some non read companies just to so called balance things out. Right. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I wanted to answer Kelvin's question as well. So probably the case in point, I'm the young investor, but I happen to have CICT and FCT in my mm. portfolio as well. I think the whole logic is, at least for myself, like, I can't speak mm. for Junyuan, is that I think it's true that you want to have a growth portfolio because relatively speaking, our capital size is small. But another point, in, if you think about it, is especially for people that want to kind of fire, right? Like financial independent, retire early, you need a steady stream of income. And if you buy at, distress valuation, which I can consider like over the last two years, they've been beaten down by a bit. You are basically locking in the yield. Hopefully these companies do well. They are ran, reverts, and then they can keep pace to inflation and interest cost comes down. Basically your dividend yield of whatever that is now, 5%, might be so-called rock bottom yield. And comparing it to like the idea of what, who was it, AK71 was talking about. He was talking about he had a lot of freehold yield, freehold assets, meaning the REIT has already paid off for itself. So the logic, at least for myself, is that I buy at kind of distressed valuations. They were at higher dividend yield right now. And then if it does well, if the business do well, they increase dividend yield. Um, at least the yield on your cost should theoretically be growing over time. And that's why you're basically locking it um, when it's down. Now. Of course, I mean, benefit of hindsight, I didn't bother about the REITs market pre this whole COVID and interest rate hike thing. So that's why I was very safe in terms of like, I didn't have very high entry price when going into it. So that's just my own thought process um, from a young investor perspective. Yeah, hope, hope, hope. It, it, yeah, <laughs> okay. I think right now it's, it's a good time to buy REITs la, for those who, who are actually looking at it. So, but the thing is that I can understand from a young investor's point of view, I, I mean, a lot of those who are new to investing, they will be like, see or not to buy at, at such at, at this point in time. La. So 
where all the, the, the trend is definitely a downtrend. So that's when they need to be very clear on what they want in their in the, in the goals. Lah. I mean, uh, you can't expect that the REITs will recover like swiftly over the next one or two years, to be very frank about it. So you need to really hold on maybe two, three, or even five years or even longer when we can see an eventual recovery. And of course, like just like every investment, there is no sure thing whether or not it can recover to the, you know, to the to the good old glory days, the all-time high. Nobody can tell. But at, at least when you buy at this at these prices now, the the chances of you making an eventual capital gain, in my opinion, is much bigger. That's my personal take. But then the capital gain doesn't matter to investors, right? It's just yeah. the more important thing is the DPU increase. Yeah, for the, the Singapore REITs lah. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, maybe you want to round up, Bunti, last two questions. Yeah, I, I just want to ask, uh, Junyuan, you recently launched a book and then you are very active, still active on investing notes. Then you have your yeah. own website. So there are, there are multiple ways viewers or readers can reach out to you. And recently you just opened up a new YouTube channel, right? So I yes. just want to understand, like, what, what's the roadmap from the perspective of like a content creator? Like what's your ambitions when it comes to YouTube and what's your plan there? Okay, as far as YouTube is concerned, actually prior to that, uh, I do not have any thoughts about setting up YouTube because of the time needed to, to, to maintain it. And also because my presentation skills isn't exactly very good. And as you can see, my English is also not exactly the best because I speak Rojak most of the time. So that's something I'm trying to brush out. And what led me to the to this eventual decision was, number one, during the REIT Symposium last month in May, where after my presentation, quite a number of uh, audiences came up to me and asked me to set up my own YouTube channel. And Eric is also one of the, one of the reasons why. Because he, during a Kopi meeting a couple of weeks back, wow, he told me so much and really, and after the meeting, when I, when I went off, uh, my mind was kind of sad. Eric is very right about, about the, the, the suggestions and the comments that he had for me. Uh, and was when I started this whole, whole thing. Uh. So thank you so much, Eric, for that. The very good advices that you have given me. So, but moving, and moving forward, I think uh, what I will be providing on YouTube will be somewhat different from on my uh, blog, where I want to focus more on un answering investors' concerns from uh, like a friend point of view friend point of view kind of thing and as to whether or not how, how much I can grow this this channel I think it's still early days because it's just this this channel is only at about a few weeks old and I, I really also need a lot of people's support in order to keep this going just like the whole investment journey that I've been in so far I think without the support of every single one on investing note as well as you guys I don't think um, I'll I'll be even here today I mean I'm very thankful for the invite, actually. I mean, for, for today. It's, it's really a great honor to be on, uh, on this, uh, this channel and uh, meet up with all of you guys here. How often do you plan to like, upload the YouTube videos? Um, I plan to do it like a once or twice a week for now. Like, but uh -huh. earning season is coming, so I might be forced to slow down the pace of the upload because I'll be very busy with updating the results of the companies. I really hope that I can keep up with the momentum of one, once or twice a week. Hopefully, I can do it. Yeah, all the best. Thank you. Kelvin, any advice? <laughs> yeah, any advice for me? I think you just keep up with the one or two. La. Ideally, three. <laughs> no, like <laughs> two minimum, I feel. Two minimum. Like, because a lot of people which I met, they say at the start, right, they have a lot of goals. Like I want to do two videos, three videos a week. Then when you follow up with them three months later, right, Oh, suddenly all gone. It's so really I think, yeah, the hardest part is, is, is just the consistency. La. So if you can do that, right. then I would say the success is almost guaranteed. Wow. Yeah. wow. Thank you. Thank you. Say something. But, that but you have to improve something every video, la. like the thumbnail, the presentation skill, the scarf stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's something yeah, because that I've, seen, I've also seen those who can produce video every day, but they don't give any value at all. So even after like two, three years, right, they're their sub count is just like barely past a thousand. So mm. yeah, basically you have to improve something. Like, otherwise, there's, you will be wasting your time. Any tips for me? Yeah. 
just in consistency, you know, they improve mm-hmm. something every video. You know. Yeah, yeah. Yes. That's all. <laughs> the last one I did was the improvement on the sound. Many thanks to you, Bunti, for that. I'm very particular <laughs> on that. Yeah, yeah. It, it, I mean, it's very hard for people to give like honest opinion. I really appreciate that because that it's only through things like that it, that I'm able to improve. Uh. So I really appreciate that. And if you see something in the future and think that I can improve, please let me know. I greatly appreciate that. Okay. I think we've come to the end of this discussion. So feel free to leave in the comments below on what you guys think of the general REITs environment in Singapore and maybe even what you guys are doing or positioning with your portfolio. So with that, we'll see you guys in the next video. And once again, thanks Trinian for coming on. Thank you so much for the invite. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, we were very excited to get Jun Yuan on because I think he was one of the few guests that we have on that is a full-time retail investor that talks mainly about um, Singapore REITs. And as we know, the REITs market has been um, rather shaky. And we, for all four of us in this panel today, we are not um, huge REIT investor. We don't have huge exposure. So maybe we'll have a part two of this entire discussion where we'll talk specifically more or we'll drill down more into our understanding and why we are not uh, maybe why we are investor or why we are not investor in REITs and also um, I think Jun Yuan has briefly talked about the so-called um, US market being topish and as you know um, Bunti is the biggest US bull here so we'll get his opinion on that so we'll see you guys in um, the second episode <laughs>